we received a bunch of questions, so I'll just start by by asking them basically. But thank you so much for it. Really interesting. I was just yeah. sitting and watching and listening to what you were saying. Um, so the first one is. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, no. How do retailers need to transform to succeed with this? And I think this was part of, you know, I mean, A, what you guys are doing, but also what is, I think, and it, it's a bit of a cheesy thing to say because it's true for all companies, more or less, but the, the role, let me call it, the, I don't want to say that everybody needs to become a tech company because, you know, but the role of technology, uh, the discussion just before me around the role of data, the the understanding of data and bringing data to bear to design these customer experiences because with great data, and that's just not consumer data, it's data across the value chain, you know, on product data, stock availability data, product attribute data, uh, those kind of things. When you can bring all that to bear, then you can design experiences that are that are relevant at scale for people. When you can provide self-service, so if suddenly you need to leave your home and you can re-book uh, your delivery time, not by having to call a call center, sit in line for 40 minutes, and then the person needs to work for 15 minutes to fix your need. If you can do that very quickly as, a, as on, on a phone, the way we are getting used to by some services, that is what people are expecting. So retailers really either themselves or in partnerships need to embrace sort of technology and the role of technology uh, that do that. And then acknowledge that they need to bring the best of their old capabilities and not leave that behind. There's a reason they're here. There's a reason you're successful. That is the past, the history, the knowledge of the business. But then you need to infuse that with new talents and together do that. It's not a digital department that's designing the future. It's the joint sort of bringing digital and the business together. And that's a really big transformation that many, not just Swedish and Nordic retailers, but global retailers are really struggling with this sort of suddenly onslaught of the importance of, of, of technology and digital and, and how to merge the old and the new. So that's a very exciting change. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I was also thinking about what you mentioned with, uh, you know, when it comes to creating a good customer experience that Amazon, for example, it's not about them being very personalized comparing them for, to Netflix, for example, but how can you, in order to create a good customer experience, how should you think around that? How do you identify the key components for your specific business to deliver the best customer experience? Yeah, and I see the question from uh, from Blin here as well. And uh, sorry, Blin, if I pronounce it wrong, but 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 I think it's important. I mean, Amazon is not the universal answer to all retail, and that's not what I'm saying either. It's not like uh, let's all go home and die because Amazon has come to Sweden. That's not the plan, right? Amazon provides a very particular service, and it's very good for a certain type of products and certain side of consumption. I feel. I think there is a massive room for more specialist platforms that can provide an even more, let's say, inspiring community feeling around that. So let, let me take uh, one uh, international example. Uh, anyone who has a passion for photography in one way or the other will know of B&H video and photo from, from uh, New York. Um, it's, it's a store in New York that has become a global vertical on camera and photograph equipment. It is the, the go-to place for professional photographers of interest on that. And, you know, again, they are then matching Amazon on price, but then they are providing so much more in terms of expertise, community, and, and that in, 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 in the area of photography. And I think that there are many verticals where you can provide a differentiated, more engaging, more personal, more inspiring customer experience that Amazon can. And I think that's up to you to do. So I do think we will see a lot of room for vertical platforms as well that really provides that and, and links that with the community uh, around, you know, topics where people have passion. Uh, I think where it's really difficult are sort of, you know, as I say, USB cable, right? If I have an Amazon Prime subscription, now this is not really working yet in Sweden. Uh, I lived in the US, my parents lived in the US, right? I mean, and when you can just on your phone, you can get a USB cable the next day at no cost. It's very difficult not to get hooked on that. And so for very sort of undifferentiated uh, consumable products and all, and many other products, it becomes a convenience. You know, having Amazon Prime in the subscription becomes a convenience way of shopping, but it's not an inspiring way of shopping. So in fashion, in many other categories, I'm sure in sports, there'll be lots of room for enthusiast platforms 
that are verticals. But you need to remember that all the steps in my evolution that came before, you still need to meet. You need to have quality, you need to have range, you need to have price. So you will not be able to charge a premium for that. The price is set by the market. And I think that's something we just need to acknowledge. There is more or less an established price. In Sweden, we have Prisiak and Price Runner. I mean, who will pay 20% more for something when you can see exactly what it costs everywhere? So price is just a given and you need to work from there. And I think that's an important part, but then you can create great experiences on the side. Mm. Great answer. Um, so let's see here. How is, here's another question. How is Sweden different than other markets that are further ahead? So, I mean, we have a, if you look at, you know, the different aspects of the, let's say the value chain, uh, one of the big part that is important in the, in the, the current convenience phase is the delivery. So whether it's home delivery or what it is, and there Sweden and other Nordic countries have ended up in a model that's it's slowly beginning with more and more home distribution. But I always say that if I want to buy a product, um, as I say, if I want to buy a product from Klaus Olsson and I need to go and buy it, and then in two days I need to go to Ica and pick it up, I might as well drive to Klaus Olsson today and buy it. I mean, yeah. right, it's not super convenient. Uh, from that perspective, and, and many of the big retail stores are established everywhere. And hence, I think right now, the innovation in the delivery space that we're seeing with all the rise of the new players as well, but also sort of home delivery options becoming cheaper, more accessible and better is an incredibly important part. If that doesn't happen, we will never overcome that sort of convenience step of that. And so, so that's really the point where, you know, and, and Sweden obviously has horrible geographics from a population density, if you compare Sweden and Holland to each other, it's it's very easy to do a home delivery business in Holland. It's a lot more sweet, uh, difficult north of Uppsala to get scale mm -hmm. in that, but we will work that out. And so to start with what we are and have seen for years is a differentiated offering in, in the larger cities and that will gradually spread to, to more and more, but also in the larger cities, we'll see a much better service offering in that. The other thing that's important is back to the customer experience, just to make a point that don't get me wrong, fast delivery is important, but more importantly than being able to deliver next day or same day is to be able to deliver at the day you promise people they will come. And so information, accuracy and timeliness, having narrow, like that part is actually more important than next day delivery. There are not a lot of things that people, don't get me wrong, if you ask people, would you like next day delivery? Of course you would, if it doesn't cost yeah. anything like yeah. that, but it's important to understand that in, in terms of disappointing customers, they can live with two days delivery. You can plan around that. What they can't deliver is if they need to sit at home from eight to five waiting for a truck that then doesn't show up. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that's a part that's a bit underestimated as well is a lot is around customer information, customer uh, closeness, communicating with the customer what's happening when so they can plan their life around it. Mm, definitely. That's very relatable to when you've been sitting there waiting for something to arrive when it doesn't actually show up. Uh, so the next question is basically, how can I compete with a giant like Amazon and actually win? The million dollar question. <laughs> no, but I think it is. Uh, I think it is. It, it is by trying not to become Amazon. You cannot beat Amazon over time in on uh, on raw scale, right? You cannot have a, a bigger range. Uh, you cannot have a a bigger. Uh, a, a better uh, delivery infrastructure and that, that they will have over time. But what you can do is knowledge of products and, and sort of expertise around that. And, and as I said, design a customer experience. But as I say to a lot of retailers, you don't need to be, be the best on delivery, but you need to get to a good enough place in the market and then you can win based on product and based on other factors, right? And this is understanding where do you want to compete with? Right, you will not have more data than uh, Amazon or Ica or someone. Or maybe you are from Ica, but if not, then you will not have more data than those players will. Right, so you need to find like what are the things that will, and then for many retailers or brands, product will actually be that. Right, people, and that's the thing. If you are a integrated player that is designing product, people often love your products. Right, that's the history of the company is the love of products, the uniqueness. Now you just need to make it good enough, convenient enough to buy them. And, you know, so make sure that th that part is not a disadvantage, but actually is that, right? But I would really talk around, like, how do you build to find out which are the parts that you want to build, uh, let's say, value around. 
Another option, if you're more a brand, can also be playing on Amazon, right? It could be say, fine, we will never do that, but we can build our brand. We can have a dual presence. We can do that. And I think that that part is uh, exciting. You saw the collaboration between Klaus Olsen and Mortem. It's quite innovative and saying, okay, Mortem has something we don't have. So let's let's team up and use, you know, sell our, and, and you know, I think that's a innovative kind of way of trying to deal with some challenges and in, 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 in that isn't happening. Mm. Definitely. Uh, great. And then the next question, what would you, what you described sounds like I need to reorganize my whole team shifting from only off, offline to online and offline. How can I buy, get a buy-in from my organization for such a change? Yeah, this is a, this is actually, a, it's a super question. And uh, I know we, people always say super question, but it is, this is, the biggest question right now worldwide in retail is what's the right operating model to support omnichannel, right? Because in reality, most retailers are multi-channel. So they have a store, a store operation, store network, store sales. They have an e-commerce department. And then there's a bit of alignment that this is the campaign we have. All right, we do click and collect, fine. But it's not truly omni, right? And, and, and that. So I think one of the first part is actually a real honest assessment. Where are we on online? And is it better to accelerate a bit more separate right now without competing, but more, how do you get speed on online? So you even have a right to play, right? If you have online share of 5% or something like that, apart from food, but if you're a specialty retailer, non-food retailer, and your online share is five, 10%, then maybe you, will you actually keep them a bit separate and just accelerate your online retail so that you become relevant in the new and then over time begin integrating. But I think part of it is, is around this idea of getting cross-functional teams with capabilities together, right? And how do you infuse people that have succeeded and won in the old in that? And, and rather than having sort of a functional organization, what are the, 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 the topics that you would want to work? So take a topic like returns just to give an example. You might organize a cross-functional pod between supply chain, your store uh, operations team, and your online team around how do we want to design a returns process that works really well in an omni-channel environment? Like what are all the constraints? Because if you don't have supply chain involved, then how do you handle the back logistics of products suddenly landing in different parts, right? So the shift that's, that's happening is beginning to get, you know, capabilities from different parts together and then give them clear parts of the customer experience, customer journey that you ask them to solve. And the fun thing is, it's a very engaging way of working that people truly enjoy. Um, and so uh, I think that, that that is that. And the best way to then, how do you get people on the journey is to start somewhere and show them. It's not to start with a mass reorg. I wouldn't do that. I would actually start by leaving the structure as it is, but begin forming these cross-functional work teams to do that. The other part is then allow the teams to spend real time on the problems, not like next to your day job. So how do you give people freedom and room to dedicate themselves? And this is the whole, you know, another buzzword of the, the agile sort of mindset. But I think if you can start that and show people that you how fast and how great you can solve problems, then that will be coming. But if you start with structure, then you lose sort of the, the momentum. How important is culture for that? And I mean, like the mindset of the employees to bring about that kind of change, what would you say? Sorry, I was reading a question, Maria. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it works. It's like there's a lot of questions coming in here. Uh, but I was just wondering how, yeah, culture and mindset of the people in the organization, because I think as human beings, we're very risk adverse. We don't like change naturally. So how can you bring about that kind of a big change um, and what do you need to do also with the mindset of the people and the culture of the organization? This is, um, this is a, a problem that many struggle with and particularly as you then, particularly if you then start, let's say, um, not just changing the culture, but then also integrating. So if you, for example, then start, uh, maybe you have acquired a, um, a startup or maybe you have recruited a lot of talent from into the digital channels and marketing and data. And then you have an, an let's say, uh, your traditional mindset in the retail. I don't want to call it old because it sounds negative, but sort of the more like the legacy of the company, the values and all that. And you have a new mindset that comes in. 
the new mindset will come in with a test and learn and sort of customer solving customer problems on a daily basis, rather than sort of the more playing the medium term play and we know how things work. And so what you need to do is you need to spend real time bringing those two mindsets together, because what you want is to design something that fits your company and with the new talent and, and sort of that, you don't just want to copy what the new talent has done somewhere, you want to design something for you. So you need to invest real time in getting the teams together. And then you need to create the psychological safety around daring to fail, test and learn and sort of that. And that is a leadership mindset around saying, how do you dare to test? How do we pilot something new in a part of Sweden, a region, a city, and we are okay with it failing? That's a leadership topic that leadership needs to understand that if you want to do this, you need to experiment because no one knows the answers. Not even the big players know the answers. Right. And then you need to dare to fail and you need to celebrate failure. We have a client that has failure Fridays, right, which is then we talk about they talk about what didn't work and those kind of things. And that mindset becomes quite important that people dare to try. They dare to fail and then learn and move on. Whereas in many other traditional companies, and this is not a consumer or retail specific, nobody wanted to be associated with the failure, right? And those failure would often be three year long ERP programs that never delivered. Now, if you can do a three month pilot in a city and it didn't work, so what? It's not the end of the business, right? But not trying it will be the end of the business because then you'll never learn, right? And that's a leadership mindset change where um, the CEO needs to really fundamentally believe this and 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 begin changing that mindset and then in trusting the teams and empowering the teams mm, definitely that's something we have at data talks as well fail fast that's a key key uh, word yeah. for us that we work with a lot because we realize the importance of it if you don't learn to fail or if you don't you're not comfortable with that you're not gonna uh try new things and accelerate um Okay, so let's see here. Another question. If you want to deliver a great customer experience, but feel very far away from it today, miles away, and you kind of answered this already about just uh, see if you have another angle on it, but you feel miles away from uh, Netflix and Amazon, um, where do you start? So I would start by, uh, by sitting down in my customer support center and um, take calls or listen to calls or go through what is what are customers calling around. And and why would I do that, right? Because you can make it a very theoretical exercise um, where you start with this framework I showed you and then we want to excel at everything. But your customers most likely or and your store frontline workers are telling you what's not working today. And then, you know, start from there to get us. I don't mean you should just do what every customer tells you, right? But yeah, I work with a, with a retailer now that has a very high incident rate of people calling call center. And a lot of it is around delivery and those kind of things. I mean, and that is then what's leading to bad reviews. If you read the reviews online, you listen to the call center, it becomes quite clear where you need to start. Then you need to set what's the ambition again. So it doesn't mean you go from being really bad to now I need to beat Amazon. It might be, I just need to get to good enough on, on delivery but I'm going to excel at inspiration, right? And that's then the part. So I would really, uh, more CEOs and more leadership teams and more people in the organization should actually get, uh, I wouldn't say a live feed, but a weekly feed of, you know, top customer complaints. I worked with Tesco for many years and, and um, they had every store, they did this customer research uh, every month and they would get the top, top 10 complaints and top 10, uh, let's say what customers really liked. And then, you know, money would be put against addressing the top 10 complaints just as a way of continuously improving um, that part the commit. But the other part then is somebody, you need, a, uh, you need a customer experience designer. I mean, you need somebody who actually has the capability of listening to customers, listening, understanding what's happening and designing a great customer experience for you. It's a, it's a capability. It's one of those new capability that people get very carried away by the data scientists and so do we, and it's a very important discipline. They get very carried away by data engineers and software development, but but uh, customer design, customer experience design is a skill and a discipline that you can buy. And it's not the same as UI UX design. These are actually people that think omni-channel, how do we want to design it? So finding a great one that is willing to understand your company and can help, let's say you on designing that journey, where to start and that is a very important uh, part of that. Mm. What's the name of that title? Is it customer experience designer or customer experience officer? Or what do you think, see trending? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, no, because I mean, like in in the in these cool cohorts, nobody wants to be an officer or a vice president, right? So it's uh, there. There are probably some experienced engineers or architects, right? Um, but it is sort of a it's a discipline around sort of customer experience design or, or mm. use uh, that, that comes in, right? And um, that's it. And and um, uh, and, and that's part of it, let's say a whole design. Uh, stack of capability the same way data engineers, data science, data architect, data manager is a is a is a capability set in the data domain. The same in, in the experience design is it needs to do that. And ideally, they work across channels. That's one of the uniqueness. Mm -hmm. If you put that in an in an um, uh, e-commerce channel, they will design an e-commerce channel that but have not thought mm -hmm. that part in. Mm. Okay, uh, and then we have one last question. Is the key in creating a great customer experience to identify how you differentiate from competitors and emphasize that towards your customers? Whether that could be you know, enthusiasm for products, recommending other relevant products, uh, having a great delivery service, and so on. Yeah, um, uh, I think that, that that's exactly, it is finding, I mean, I showed that you can't be best at everything. And most retailers and most companies are simply not big enough to invest in everything. And also understanding where do we just partner and and do. But in the end, you need to go back to why is it that, you know, re uh, consumers love your 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 brand. And, um, and for many uh, companies that are fully integrated, that is that they actually make products, right? So let me take a, so a company uh, that actually make their own products. Often it relates to the product itself. People are enthusiastic about the product and feel, you know, it can be loaded with different values, whether it's price, sustainability, great quality, like that's in the end what people love about the brand. If you are a, a retailer in its true essence that you are a reseller of other people's products, maybe it is the convenience. Maybe it is the fact that you cater to different specific needs and situations. And then that's what you understand. So let's take an example. If you are more, uh, let's say, somebody that solves, uh, then maybe you need to design the entrance to the website, not about here are the categories, and then you need to navigate, but much more what are the problems the customer is trying to solve, right? So if you're a DIY store, maybe you know people don't go in and buy, I buy screws. People build projects, right? I am building a terrace. I am doing something. And hence, maybe you should design the online experience more to be related to the mindset in which the customer comes. In fashion, it's very, you know, some people will go in and say, I need a pair of jeans. And so there's one entrance point that needs to be very sort of functional. Like I need to just find all the jeans. I don't want to be able to see all the jeans you have. Uh, for that customer, it doesn't help that if all the jeans are located in different departments based on style, as an example. But there could also be a customer use case where you say, actually, my entrance is inspiration. And that's why I go to this brand for, I want to be inspired and, and that's how I lead to the product. So you need to find out, you know, what is it that your uniqueness is and how do you then design that experience to uh, to fit that? And again, acknowledging that price and all those parts just needs to be, it's a given. And then, uh, mm. you know, that that's a part and, and how do you build design around that? Mm. And just, uh, just one quick follow-up question on that. How do you identify that uniqueness? Do you have any good tips for if you're struggling with finding your uniqueness? What would you um, encourage? That kind? I, I, I hate to come back to it. And, and this is one part that you will not. Uh, I'm a so I'm a huge fan of customer data mining and data analysis and all that. So don't. Uh, but this is one where sort of ethnographic research. And so back to um, the question that I also see there was one around, like, where do you find great design? Uh, and so, so many of the design agencies have these kind of capabilities and you can work with somebody who does consumer research. And I don't mean like AC Nielsen, like uh, 17,000 people said that, but really work on getting to the depth of why people love your brand and sort of beginning to put words and emotion on that. So consumer research and engaging with consumers and, and being there with consumers to hear becomes an important part in, in really understanding what it is that, that comes up. And also being honest around it, right? If you are a reseller of products, so everything is bought in the Far East or Eastern Europe and you are selling, maybe the point of differentiation is actually location and store. And mm. if that's the case, then there's a real urgency in designing. So what is our differentiation in an online environment? Because you will have a few years where your brand name will maybe carry you, 
But then if you, there's nothing else that sticks out, if you're not great on selection, you're not great on quality, you're not great on price, it, it was just the store location that was you know unique in Sweden before, you will have a long-term challenge. And that's an example where Amazon will be dangerous, right? If there are no other values, uh, listen to that. Cool, great. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. It was a really interesting session. Uh, thank you so thank much you. for coming here thank and for joining us today. Thank you so, for all the great questions. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, thank you. Uh,